<sighs> okay, we're live. Hello and welcome to Intelligent Speech 2020. My name is Maisha. I'll be your moderator and admin for this event. Uh, we're welcoming here Eric Marcus, uh, who is very glad to be with us today. So just a quick rundown before I hand over to our speaker. Uh, we should have 20 minutes for him to speak and for him to, to talk about what he's coming to talk about. We will then have 20 minutes for a Q&A session. Uh, and if any of you want to ask a question, you feel free to go to the ask a question tab, which should be at the bottom of your page in between call to action and polls. And you can just ask a question there um, and hopefully it gets picked at the end. And then any general chat uh, can be put in the sidebar there. So uh, I welcome Eric Marcus and I will now hand over to him. Thank you, Maisha. I really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Making Gay History in brief. I'm the uh, founder and host of Making Gay History. And what I'm planning to do this morning with you is just to share um, little tidbits from the archive to give you a taste of what I do. And what Making Gay History is, um, is that we bring LGBTQ history to life for the voice, uh, uh, with, <laughs> through the voices of the people who lived it, uh, drawn principally from my archive of 100 interviews that I did for two editions of a book called Making Gay History which was first published in 1992. And I thank my 30 year old self for thinking to use broadcast quality equipment at that time to record all of the interviews. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the opportunity to, uh, to share these stories with you today um, and could not possibly have made a podcast. The podcast was an accident. It started off as an educational project uh, with an organization called History on Erase. They were interested in using clips from my archive specifically for uh, eighth and 11th grade American history curricula. And in working with Sarah Birmingham, who's an incredibly talented uh, audio producer, uh, once Sarah edited some of these pieces down to 15 minutes, she said, I think this is a podcast. Uh, and very long story short, um, Sarah said, I need to go to pod podcast school, which she did for five days. And she met Jenna Weiss Berman from Pineapple Street Studios, who was one of the professors. And she loved our work and she said, what can I do to help you get launched? And five weeks later, we launched with a fully fledged website, which you can find at makinggayhistory.com and our first season of 10 episodes. And since then, we've had a total of seven seasons, uh, more than 80 episodes. We've been downloaded more than 3 million times in 200 countries and territories around the world. So I want to give you a quick taste. Um, I could talk plenty more uh, about what we do. Happy to answer your questions during the Q&A period after this short presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen and let's see if it all works. And here we go. So this is much normally a much longer presentation. So I'm gonna uh, speed through some uh, some of the slides and not uh, share audio from, uh, from the, uh, this presentation. Um, this is Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld. We did an episode with him since he founded the movement in 1897 in Germany. It didn't start in the US in 1969. Um, it actually started in the, in the US, it started in 1950 uh, when the Manicheen Society was founded. Um, we have a, a this, the problem with Magnus Hirschfeld is there's no actual audio. So we had to do a, an audio documentary about um, this incredibly uh, forward looking doctor um, whose institute was burned by the, the Nazis in 1933. You'll have to listen to that on the, on the uh, uh, it, on our website at makinggayisrael.com or wherever you get your podcasts. I wanna share with you an interview that I didn't do. Um, this is Bayard Rustin, who was a, a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He also was the uh, principal organizer of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And typically we don't learn about Bayard Rustin in school when we learn about the black civil rights movement because Bayard Rustin was openly gay from early in life, which was a very dangerous thing to be but he was true to himself from the beginning. And despite the challenges he faced because of who he was, um, he served an incredibly important role in the movement, but stayed in the background. So I'm gonna, uh, uh, so I didn't get to interview Bayard. He died a year before um, uh, I started my work in 1987. Um, but we found this extraordinary tape. It was an interview that Bayard Rustin did with a gay newspaper in Washington, DC. Um, in this interview, he talks about the impact of his sexuality on his role in the uh, black civil rights movement. It was on a cassette tape in a box under the bed of his uh, surviving partner, Walter Nagel, who graciously let us use this tape. So here's a little bit of Bayard Rustin. The quality isn't the best, but what Bayard has to say is very important. During the civil rights movement, 
Dr. King and his associates were being monitored by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, wanted to disrupt King's efforts however he could. The FBI director saw Bayard as an easy target. J. Edgar Hoover began to circulate all kinds of stories about Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. one of which was that he was a friend of mine hinting that somehow or other there might be some homosexual relationship going on between us. Mm -hmm. This frightened a number of the people in Martin Luther King's movement. At a given point, there was so much pressure on Dr. King about my being gay, and particularly because I would not deny it, that he set up a committee to explore whether it would be dangerous for me to continue working with him. And naturally, I took the position that if people feel that I am a danger to so important I would leave. What I love about this interview with Bayard Rustin is that it provides a window into uh, an aspect of history that most of us know nothing about. Um, and also introduces us to this extraordinary human being whose words of wisdom ring even more true today than they did in 1987 when that interview was recorded. Um, I'm gonna play another uh, interview. This is somebody I didn't interview. She left the movement in the late 1960s, Ernestine Eckstein. Um, if you've ever heard her name, actually you probably haven't heard her name, um, you may remember her image because she is famously in a 1965 photo from a, an, a protest in front of the White House. There was one African-American woman, her hair was in a chignon. I don't get to see the, say that word too often. She was in heels, a skirt, a blouse, and white framed um, uh, cat's eye sunglasses. Um, Ernestine was all of 24 years old when this interview was recorded in 1965 by uh, Barbara Giddings and Kay LaHusen, who were two key members of what was then called the homophile movement. And they were interview interviewing Ernestine about uh, her thoughts on the movement. Now, uh, again, the quality is not the best, but this is a very important interview. Ernestine also appeared on the cover of The Ladder, which was the magazine of the Daughters of Belitis, an early lesbian organization for lesbians founded in 1955. This is from the issue of uh, the June 1966 uh, edition. It was so brave of her to do this because she was a civil servant. She had a government job and could easily have been fired if anyone recognized her. So this is just a brief clip of Ernestine Eckstein, who I tried to track down in 1988 and 89. I could not find her. She had moved to the West Coast and joined the black feminist movement there, and it simply disappeared. Um, so we found this uh, interview in the, in the bowels of the New York Public Library. Do they form some civil disobedience for our movement at this time or in the future? Uh, picketing, I, I regard as very uh, almost a conservative activity now. You know, <laughs> I mean, you did. You know, and that kind of thing, other things. Yeah. Yeah. And all of this is an educational process of calling attention to the unjustness of the situation, which is the same thing the Negro did. Are there any ways in which you think our movement could emulate the Negro or other movements? Um, which it's, uh, not doing right now. Uh, I don't find in the homophile movement enough stress on courtroom action. That is, I can't envision at this point President Johnson uh, coming out in favor of a bill for homosexual rights mm -hmm. to work in government today. I can't even envision um, there being any kind of bill comparable to the 1954 education bill. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see more test cases in court so the thing can be brought out in the open. Ernestine believed that LGBTQ people needed to come out and be seen, which was a very challenging idea back then. A homosexual is hidden, except for the, the, the stereotypes, you know, and I think they have to become visible, you know, and assert themselves uh, politically in, in, in every way that any other group does, you know? Um, and I think once they begin to do this, society will begin to give more and more and more, you know? And we want acceptance, and we want our rights as citizens and as people 
But do you think it's, uh, it's possible in the in the present climate of opinion for homosexuals who have self confidence in themselves to do this openly? I think it takes a lot of courage, uh -huh. and I think a lot of people who do it will suffer because of it. But I think any movement needs a certain number of courageous martyrs, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and there's no getting around it. You know, that's really the only thing that can be done. You have to come out and be strong enough to accept whatever consequences come, I think. I think this may have been the first time that anyone spoke about this concept of coming out. Um, people talked about about being open in other ways, but not the phrase coming out. I wish Ernestine had lived long enough to uh, have seen the recent Supreme Court case, uh, which now uh, bans discrimination against LGBTQ people in employment. She was really a visionary at age 24. Um, Morty Manford is somebody I, inter I interviewed in 1989. Uh, he and his mom, Jean Manford, co-founded PFLAG, Parents, Friends, and Families of Lesbians and Gays. But Morty was, was in his own right um, this really, really brave young activist. And here he is being arrested after one of the protests uh, that he participated in. He was president of the Gay Activist Alliance in his early 20s. And the story he's about to tell here is, was a protest, uh, a quickly organized protest, uh, and it was impossible to get inside. It was in Greenwich Village. Uh, it was a protest against uh, then Mayor Lindsay, uh, John Lindsay, uh, who was not preventing the police from abusing gay people. So uh, Morty here, Morty talks here, it was September 21st, 1971, Morty's 21st birthday, and he found himself in a situation, um, well, I'll let Morty tell you, it's one of my favorite stories and it inspires me every day. Somehow or another, I got inside. Uh, I mean, All by yourself. So you're, you were yeah, the only one to get in. Yeah what, maybe a thousand people sitting in the audience and, and the mayor was up at the podium talking. Well, there I was. What was I going to do? It was just me. So naturally, I did what anyone else would do. I walked onto the stage and I took the podium away from John Lindsay. <laughs> I walked up right next to him and I uh, said, uh, so the audience could hear, police are brutalizing gay people three blocks away from where we're sitting. Oh, the, and the, the police um, harassment and, and attacks were even going on that night. That was one of the points that I made. I wasn't there very long, but what I said made an impression. The police dragged me off the back of the stage and they ejected me through, you know, some, some or another uh, exit. Apparently, after I left, the audience called the mayor to account for what was going on with the police bothering the gay community. And um, apparently, John Lindsay had made a statement that uh, he would permit me to speak if, if I wanted. Of course, he knew darn well the police had already thrown me out didn't realize that I would come back. <laughs> and I, I, I snuck back in. I mean, I broke through the security lines again. I, I can't tell you how I did it, but I got back in. And I came right down that aisle. <laughs> and I could see him looking up from the podium at me, you know, biting his lip and saying, oh, shit, here he comes again. And I walked right back up on stage and I said to him, I understand you said I can speak. <laughs> and he said yes, and he yielded the podium to me. And I uh, addressed the audience about the police brutality and, and the harassment we were facing. And I said my piece, I thanked them and I left as surreptitiously as I've entered. One of the things I love about this interview with Morty is that he's 39 when I'm uh, interviewing him, and you can hear he's when he laughs at how, uh, how surprised he is that he was so brave as a young man. Um, he's, it's almost as like if he couldn't believe what he did um, and recognized when he said, well, what would anyone else do? 
you know, I, I marched right down to the stage and took the microphone away from the mayor. Um, Morty died shortly before the book, book was published in 1992. Um, his mom called me. We stayed in touch. Um, in fact, his mom and my mom co-founded PFLAG Queens years later. Uh, Gene called me uh, and said that Morty was concerned that no one would ever remember his contributions to the movement. Uh, and I said, would you like to read, would you like me to send you his chapter from the book, which was finished by then? Um, and she said, well, he can't read anymore. And I said, well, how about if I send it to you and you can read it to him, which she did. And he died soon after. Um, so I feel a special responsibility to the people I interviewed, almost all of whom have since died, um, to share their stories um, so that generations to come will know of the work of the people whose shoulders we stand on today, um, who set a fine example for how to get things done. Um, I'm gonna play one more interview for you. I'm gonna speed ahead through a few things. This was Jean Manford, uh, Morty's mom. Um, she marched in the Pride March in 1972 in New York, carrying this sign, Parents of Gays Unite in Support for Our Children, which led to the founding of PFLAG. Um, Perry Watkins, um, who was thrown out of the military after 15 years because he was gay, checked the box that said he was gay, so he shouldn't have been taken into the military in 1968 and was thrown out later, challenged his court case uh, I'm sorry, challenged the government in court and won. And, uh, but you'll have to listen to that episode because I want to get to Dipper Johnson and Zandra Rolan. Um, they were going out for just a romantic dinner, the two of them in 1983. Uh, and well, I'll let you tell them. Uh, so let them tell you what happened when they went for this romantic dinner, just the two of them. At the time I was working on Saturdays. So this was the first weekend that we were going to have a complete weekend together uh, since we had gotten together. It was also the year right before Martin Luther King's birthday was made into a holiday. And a friend of mine told me about this restaurant that was really nice. And the restaurant had these six booths on one side that were real romantic. And we got there and the, um, the waiter kind of questioned us about, are you sure you want the booths? And we told them yes. And it's the type of booths where you have to move the table out so that you can get in, like a horseshoe. And in the middle of the horseshoe was like a fountain and there was a guy with a, a violinist who came around and, and the boot right in front of the, of the table was a little white sheer curtain that closed in the candlelight and it was just romantic. Did it occur to you that, there, that this might be a problem? Not at all. I mean, to me, discrimination never enters my mind first. Huh ever so they showed us to our table we sit down and we're taking our jackets off and this tall humongous guy comes by and and okay. yanked the table away and told us you know you know so sorry you know but you can't sit here it's against, it's the, against the, law the law and you know to serve two, two men, men or two women in these booths you know, and we asked for the, to see the manager and we weren't manager. gonna move the guy that uh, turned out to be the real maitre d kept giving us the you know the back of the bus type of thing you know where you can sit over there and you can sit over here and you'll have free drinks and the whole thing but you will not you cannot sit here you will not be served here and kept insisting that it was against the law it was against the law and you know that that really oh it makes me crazy thinking about it you know it made me more mad so you got to remember, we were there about Martin Luther King's birthday, and then we were going to take it off the next day as this real show of solidarity and its importance in the whole bit. And if there's anything that King had taught us, it was that we could sit anywhere in the restaurant we wanted to sit. Deborah and Zandra, I should add, are both still very much alive. Um, what I find so interesting and important about this interview, and I'm going, uh, going to stop sharing so I can, you can see me. Hi, I'm back. Um, what's so interesting is uh, about these two is that they were regular citizens and they challenged discrimination. Um, they hired um, Gloria Allred, who has since gone on to become very famous for discrimination cases. Um, they won their case based on California's uh, law that um, uh, made discrimination against LGBTQ people illegal, actually just gay and lesbian people then, uh, but the law hadn't been tested yet. They won, but the owner of the Papa Shoe restaurant decided that rather than serve same-sex couples, 
um, he would eliminate the romantic booth. So he held a press conference, had all the booths hauled to the curb and said on this day, romantic dining died. Sort of like what happened in the South when, uh, when uh, integration of, of public pools was required and uh, pools were shut rather than uh, to allow them to be integrated. So that's just a, a, a tiny taste of what we have uh, in the Making Gay History episode archive. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the question box at the bottom. Um, I'm also great at asking myself questions. Um, and I can also go back to the presentation and share some other uh, treasures from my archive. So um, Maisha, are there any questions? Uh, not so far, although I have seen a question in the side tab that someone maybe has asked offhand asking where the restaurant is or was rather. I think people will be surprised to find out that it's in Los Angeles or it was in Los Angeles. Um, we don't think of Los Angeles as a place where that sort of thing happens, but it certainly did um, in 1983. Um, in the interview that I did with Deborah and Zandra, uh, uh, Deborah talked about what the gay bars were like in those days when they uh, required African Americans to show three forms of identification to get in. So a lot more to be heard here. Um, I have a question for myself. What else are you working on? So um, I got a call and I see there's one question I'll go to in a moment. I got a call from the director of the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies uh, at Yale University. They house a collection of more than 4,000 videotaped testimonies of survivors of and witnesses to the Holocaust. And he asked if I knew anyone who could produce a podcast for their archive, similar to what I produced for Making Gay History, to provide a window into their archive to give people a taste of what they had. Um, I apologize for the beeping. I forgot to quit out of my email, which I'm going to do right now. I'm back. Hi. Um, so we won't get beeped again. So uh, I grew up in a neighborhood in, in New York City called Kew Gardens, which was filled with refugees from World War II, Jewish refugees, uh, many of them Holocaust survivors. So when uh, Stephen Naren from the uh, Fortunate Video Ar Archive for Holocaust Testimonies asked if I knew anyone who could do this, I raised my hand and I said, if you don't mind working with someone who barely knows what he's doing, uh, I can do this. So uh, we finished our first season last fall. Um, we are now producing a second season. You can find it at uh, thosewhowerethere.org. Uh, the podcast is called Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust. And it's extraordinary testimony. Um, and it, it makes the, the Holocaust personal in a way that the statistics don't. Um, so I see there are three yeah, questions. We have, a, we have a question. Uh, one of them has already been asked. The next one, uh, Linda Yancey asked, have you or do you have any plans to look into LGBT history in the ancient world? In the ancient world? Yeah. No. no. Um, <laughs> the nature of a podcast is that you need audio. Um, we've done a couple of episodes now with uh, people who, for whom we didn't have any audio, and it was brutal. It requires so much extra work. And the joy for me in doing this work is using archival audio. Uh, oh, so if, you, if anyone turns up audio from ancient history, let me know. Um, we're still looking for audio from Magnus Hirschfeld, um, and I'm guessing none exists. So, okay. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, another question here. Some uh, Lisa Rosenthal has said we, she thinks that we are in a period of political retrenchment where sentiments that many of us thought were no longer felt are openly expressed, including very hostile sentiments toward gay people. In light of the history of gay and lesbian rights and the fight for them, do you see any hope in this moment? And if so, why? Oh, I definitely see hope. I've lived long enough now to see uh, waves of progress and waves of um, pushback. Um, I remember when I wrote a paper my freshman year of college uh, about about homosexuals, as they were called then, um, my sociology teacher said that I was a little too optimistic and that given all the progress she expected there would be um, pushback. And every time we make a step forward, we there is a push against us. And what people who, who try to roll back our rights don't understand is that every time they do that, more and more people come out of the closet, especially younger people who are even more intolerant than us older people, because we feel there's been lots of progress. Um, uh, but for a younger person just arriving in the world today, they see where things are now and they want to push them ahead. So I absolutely see hope. Um, uh, there are very tough times for many people around the world who live in countries that are uh, not only not accepting, but brutal. Uh, there's a new uh, 
HBO documentary that is being streamed on June 30th called Welcome to Chechnya. Shocking, shocking what has been done in Chechnya to gay people, uh, to LGBTQ people. I've never been so deeply affected as I was uh, watching that documentary. Um, it's produced by David France, uh, who also did, um, oh, I always forget his film about AIDS, um, How to Survive a Plague. So um, yes, I'm very hopeful for the future. I mean, just look what happened in one week last week, uh, the, uh, or two weeks ago, the president uh, ordered the rollback of protections for trans people in healthcare, which was horrifying and cruel and wrong. And the next week, the US Supreme Court uh, ruled six to three um, in favor of, uh, of um, banning discrimination against gay people in employment. So there's lots to be done, but I'm very hopeful. Okay, so we've got another question. Actually, this question has been asked three times by three different people. Um, someone said, apart from the person you mentioned in the slide, have you done any other work with queer veterans? Uh, yes, um, yes. So there's another interview in, in my archive with um, Copy Berg. Uh, in fact, it's in, we did an episode with Copy Berg. He was uh, in the Navy. Um, most people don't know who he is. His case was, was paired with Leonard Matlovich um, uh, in the 1970s. Um, Leonard, Leonard Matlovich famously was on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and I'm guessing there are others, other veterans in my archive, but I can't recall offhand. Okay. Uh, another question from Alexander Martin it says, what do you think makes the 20th century or late 19th century the time when the LGBTQ rights movement kicked off? And uh, how much do we know about attitudes towards LGBTQ people and how we thought about ourselves prior to then? Well, what was happening, and I'm no expert on this. Um, I know a lot more now because we did an episode with Magnus Hirschfeld. So I suggest listening to our Magnus Hirschfeld episode, which contains a lot of information that will answer your questions. Um, the climate in Germany was such at the time that there was exploration of sexuality by, by people who are expert in these things. Um, and enough freedom within Germany that uh, these efforts were not crushed until 1933 with the rise of the Nazis. Um, I went to the Schwules Museum, the gay museum in Berlin. They have an unbelievable collection. Um, and in, on their shelves were, were, were magazines for trans people from the 1920s. Um, what the German experience says to me is we should never be too complacent because things can be rolled back that our, our fight is never over um, and we have to keep fighting our battles over and over again because there are always people who uh, will try to destroy us. Um, so uh, listen to the Magnus Hirschfeld episode. I think, I think it'll help, uh, help you understand a lot about our history. Okay, uh, we have another question from Owen, who is a high school teacher, saying, mm. do you have any suggestions for the most important pieces in your archive for high school students to hear? Well, in fact, the, the pieces that I played for you today are part of uh, uh, a collection of educational resources produced by uh, an organization called History Unerased. Um, you can find the organization at unerased.org. We've done a lot of work with the New York City Department of Education to create um, resources for teachers. Uh, although it's complicated teaching the subject, you certainly need to start with resources. And I know teachers are already using episodes from Making Gay History for uh, classrooms. What we did for History Unerased is we prepared six minute versions of our podcast episodes that go along with curriculum materials. So the, the students can listen to that in class and then they can go home and listen if they wish to the longer episodes. Um, also, I suggest having a look at uh, the website for Facing History and Ourselves. They also have done work in this area and have resources available. And uh, one other resource for you, the One Archives at the USC Library, they have created uh, resources for educators as well. There's a lot out there, you have to sort through it. I'm sorry it's not more organized, but it goes state by state, district by district. Okay, uh, Chris Silver asks, how does where we are now in 2020 with LGBTQ rights compare to the wish list from, for example, pre-Stonewall, pre-AIDS, pre-2000? How about pre-when pre I was growing up, or just when I was growing up? Um, I couldn't have imagined a time like this. Um, I didn't know anybody who was gay. I didn't know anything about our history. I didn't know there was a history before Stonewall. Um, when I was growing up, uh, actually, by the time I, in 1973, homosexuality was removed from the list of mental illnesses. So I was a very lucky person to be growing up in the, in the mid 70s. But, um, oh my God, I think of someone like Lisa Ben, one of our early episodes. Her real name is Edith Ide. In 1947, she published a newsletter uh, on her office typewriter, typed through twice using five sheets of carbon paper each time. 
distributed those new, uh, newsletters, well, she called it a magazine to her friends. She called it Vice Versa, America's Gayest Magazine. And she had a column called the Whatchama Column in which she talked about her hopes and dreams for the future. And in 1947, she predicted the world we live in today. And she also sang songs that she wrote and then also uh, songs, uh, popular songs for which she wrote lyrics, her own lyrics, gay lyrics. And you can hear all of that in the two episodes we did with Edith Hyde, one from our first season of the podcast and a bonus episode as well. Um, I, 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 I often said in 1988, when I did the Male Couples Guide, my first book, and I was asked, do you think that gay people will ever be allowed to legally marry? I said over and over again, um, I don't expect to live long enough to see that day come. Well lived long enough. Um, I'm very lucky that I did. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question, Monica. Okay, so actually for now, we haven't got any more questions. So uh, I think I'll leave this up to you. I'll keep an eye if we do, but if you maybe want to talk a bit more about a question you've got, or maybe go back to your PowerPoint. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint and share another story with you, the veteran story, because uh, that was uh, one that someone asked about. Yeah. Um, so let's go to, um, there we are, Perry Watkins. Um, so uh, Perry checked the box on the uh, military intake form when he was 18 years old, he'd been called back from Europe where he was studying dance. He expected that because he was gay and they weren't taking gay people in the military then, that he would be on his way back on a plane to Europe to study dance, but they took him anyway. Now, I think this piece of, the, of, clip that, a piece of tape that you'll hear is where I'm saying to Perry, I can't believe that they still took him. Um, and he had to persuade me that that was the case. So here's Perry Watkins. Oh. Did you know you wanted to work in the military? I didn't want to. I did not check the box yes because I wanted to go in the military. I yeah. laugh when yeah. the army now defends their, you know, oh, well, this is so terrible. All they had to do was comply with their regulation, which said they cannot take me if I checked that box. You yes. checked the box. I checked the box, yes, and I was drafted anyway. You checked the box that said homosexuality? Would you like to see a copy of the form? I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> I think I'm a... you checked the homosexual box. Yes. You were drafted. Yes. I would be curious to do a statistical report, an investigative type report on the number of people who checked the block, yes, what their race was, how many of them that were white were drafted anyway. What year were you drafted? 1968. Vietnam War. Yeah. Good thinking. Were you shocked? Yes, that's why I find it absolutely ludicrous that the army is in court saying, we don't want this man. Well, why the hell did you take me? 15 years later, I'm still in court. I lost, this is a rental. I used to own a house not a mile from here. Mm -hmm. I lost it because when I got thrown out of the army, I didn't have an income. I don't have heat in my house now because I don't make enough money you know, to turn on the heat. Mm -hmm. But yet I'm dealing with a system of justice who's looking at the facts in my case and going, well, we can't tell the army not to comply with their regulation. Well, who the told them not to comply with it to begin with? So Perry won his case. Um, he won reinstatement. He took a settlement instead. He was the grand marshal at the New York City Pride March in 1993 and then died within a couple of years after that of AIDS, which I think is why we don't know about him. Maisha, do we have time for one more? Yeah, we definitely have time for one question. Alexander Marteau in the chat says, uh, just double checking, what year did he say he entered the military? 1968, the height of the Vietnam War. That was the peak year, uh, the peak year of the draft. Okay. Uh, we still don't have any more questions yet, and we still do actually have three or four minutes left. So if there's anything else you want to say or play. Yeah, I want to play Jean Manford. This is Morty Manford's mom um, about... Uh, um, this is about how she came to to march in the Pride March. So here, here's Jean, and if we have time after, I'll explain more. But you can hear the whole episode on our uh, makinggayhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on uh, Instagram, Making Gay History Podcast, and on Twitter, Making Gay History, and we are also, of course, on Facebook. Um, and if you have further questions, you can always email me at uh, eric at ericmarcus.com. Here's Jean Manford. We felt that it was a way of educating the public and, you know, making people understand. And besides that, when I did march with Morty, was it 72? You no, know, he said, March, will you march with us? I said to him, I will march if you let me carry a sign. Parents of gays unite in support for our children. How did people react to you then? They screamed, they yelled, they ran over and kissed me. Well, would you talk to my mother? Uh, wow, my mother saw me here, you know, and 
they, they just couldn't believe that uh, a parent would do that. They were fearful of telling parents. Most of them wouldn't tell. And many had been rejected because the parents knew. I guess they just didn't feel that any parent could be supportive of a gay child. The, the symbolic presence that my mother provided was a sign of great hope that parents can be supportive, that the people we're closest to, whom we love the most, need not be our enemies, can be our supporters. As Morty and I walked along during that first march, so many people said, talk to my parents, and there were phone calls all day long, that phone was ringing. So that's when we decided that during the march to start something, some we kind of an organization, yes. So um, that organization now, of course, is a nationwide organization with hundreds of chapters for uh, the parents of LGBTQ uh, children. And they also uh, are a great resource for LGBTQ young people who are looking for advice from parents when they can't talk to their own parents. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm coming back. There we are. Um, Maisha, um, are we winding down? Yeah, uh, we don't have, still don't have any further questions. We've got about two minutes left. So if you want to make any closing remarks, uh, go ahead. I do. Um, one of the things I've learned from uh, meeting all of these extraordinary people who I had the privilege to interview uh, decades ago is that collectively we have far more power than we think. Um, but as... Um, Ernestine Eckstein said, we have to be out, we have to be present, people have to see us, um, and we have to work together, even if we don't always like working together. Um, and uh, one of the things people often ask me is, well, why can't gay people, LGBTQ people, get along today the way we once did? We never got along. And that was something that came across in interview after interview, that the femme men didn't like the straight acting men, the straight acting men didn't like the femme men, the men, some men didn't like the women, some women didn't like the men, um, there are conflicts between the trans men and the, uh, I'm sorry, trans people and uh, the lesbians in the early 70s. But collectively, look at what we've accomplished. Um, and I think that by listening to the people who came before us, it, will, it provides inspiration and also ideas for how we can make a difference. Um, it happens over kitchen tables. It happens in the streets. Um, it happens in Congress. Um, we can all contribute, uh, each of us, in our own way. So um, please, again, have a look at uh, our website, makinggayhistory.com. We have an article that goes along with every episode, which provides additional information uh, for each of the people we interviewed. And we also include archival photos, um, which are uh, some real gems. Um, and you can also find Making Gay History wherever you can find your podcast, wherever you, wherever you find podcasts. Um, and also have a listen to those who are there, uh, Voices from the Holocaust, which you can find at those who are there Org. Um, so I want to thank you for joining me today. And Maisha, thanks for your help with this, uh, this talk. And I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Um, we will be back, I'll be back at 3.15 Eastern in a conversation with um, um, a couple of different people about how we can use voices of other people in our work um, to, to what? I've forgotten what, we're, what the topic is, but it's there. See you this afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone, uh, and hopefully see you in another session. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure, Maisha. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.